Good evening. My name is Allie Weber, and I'm also a student with the University of Washington's Engage program. I study the neuroscience of vision. So my work focuses on understanding how our eyes adapt to help us see the constantly changing world around us. Before we get to our final talk of the evening, I'd also like to mention that the best way to keep up with Town Hall's program is to become a member. Membership offers down front seating, discounts on book and ticket purchases, and a mail copy of Town Hall's monthly calendar. And it provides the support essential to bringing you more than 400 events annually at affordable ticket prices. And now to our final speaker. Katie Baker studies pathology at the University of Washington. Her work focuses on developing more effective and less invasive ways of detecting a form of colon cancer. Please give a warm welcome to Katie Baker. Um, <clears throat> so raise your hand if you know someone or you've personally been diagnosed with cancer. Right. So <laughs> that, that's about what I expected. And that's because cancer is a worldwide problem. About one in three women and one in two men will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. And so to put that in perspective, half of the people in this room will be diagnosed with cancer at some point. And in the US, uh, in 2016 alone, there were an estimated 1.7 million new cases and about 600,000 deaths due to cancer. And it continues to be the number two killer uh, in the United States alone. And so cancer feels very personal to a lot of people. And it feels personal to me because there's been a lot of cancer in my family. And so I spend my time as a graduate student trying to understand the genetics of cancer to help prevent other families from going through what we've gone through. And so I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But first, I want to talk, uh, start from the beginning and talk a little bit about what exactly is cancer. And so this is a cell, um, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. But this is the smallest unit of everything that's alive. And typically, these cells divide. And that's so that when a cell is too old or it dies, it can replace itself, or this allows the body to grow. And there are signals that tell cells when they should and shouldn't divide. So normally, when, they, when you have enough cells, these stop. But in the setting of cancer, this signal that should tell these cells to stop dividing uh, goes wrong. And so this can form a clump of cells called a tumor. And these cells can then move to other parts of the body and invade. And these are called metastases. Now, cancer is a genetic disease, meaning that it's caused by DNA. And DNA is the instruction manual that you inherit from your parents that tells your body what it should look like. And changes to this DNA is called a mutation. And these mutations are what cause a normal cell to develop into a tumor cell. Now, stretches of DNA are called genes. And some important genes that have to do with cancer um, are called tumor suppressors. And if you think of your cell like a car, you can think of these tumor suppressors like the brakes. These are supposed to tell the cells when they should stop. So if you acquire a mutation in your tumor suppressor, it's like cutting your brakes. Now, another important class of genes that have to do with cancer are called oncogenes. And again, if you think of your cell as a car, these are your gas pedal. These normally tell cells that they should divide. So if you got a mutation in an oncogene, it's like putting a brick on your gas pedal. And so these two mutations are different but the effect is the same. Now the biggest question I get as a cancer researcher is what causes cancer? What am I doing? Or what can I do to prevent cancer from happening? And so one thing that we know a lot about is environment. So things like smoking and exposure to UV are very well known to cause cancer. Um, we're just now learning what contribution our diet is playing in causing cancer. We also know that infections can increase our risk for cancer. So these are things like um, HPV or the hepatitis C uh, virus. Um, another thing that affects your risk for cancer is heredity. So you can have genes passed on from your parents that increase your risk of cancer. So thanks, mom and dad, for that one. And finally, some of this just happens by chance. Your body is made up of billions of cells, and these cells divide all the time. And so sometimes a mistake just happens. And that's why a healthy person uh, can develop cancer. It just happens by probability. 
Um, so I think a lot of people think of cancer as a more modern disease, but really it's pretty ancient. Um, the first mention we have had of cancer is in an ancient Egyptian medical text from 1550 BC, and all it said on the subject was, you can't do anything about it. Now this very uh, cheerful looking gen gentleman is Hippocrates, and he was a Greek physician, and he's very important in the field of medicine. In fact, the, the oath that doctors take when they finish medical school is called the Hippocratic Oath. And when he took a look at tumors and saw the veins and protrusions that stick out from them, he said, hmm, kind of looks like a crab. And the word for that is carcinos. But later, after Greece became part of the Roman Empire, this man named Celsus said, we'll call it cancer. Now, this is Galen. He's a little bit hard to see, but he's this gentleman cutting into a pig. And um, he noticed that most tumors involve swelling. And so the word for that is onchos. And so doctors that study cancer are called oncologists. Now, Whereas he was perfectly fine uh, cutting into a pig here, uh, Celsus said surgery, and most people said no. There was a huge taboo about cutting into human bodies alive or dead. And so for thousands of years, there was nothing that we could do. The, the field didn't advance. And so it wasn't until the 16th and 17th centuries when that taboo was lifted and we were able to do autopsies and surgery when this man, John Hunter, who was a Scottish physician, noticed that you can move tumors around when you touch them. And so he said that there's no impropriety in removing it. Although you would probably disagree because he was removing it without anesthesia at that point. Um, and so with the advent of anesthesia, surgical pre prevention for cancer grew. And so um, William Stuart Halstead invented the radical mastectomy at the end of the 19th century. And from there, the study of cancer research really grew. And so um, radiation was developed. Uh, Sidney Farber developed the first chemotherapy to treat leukemia. And in 1971, Richard Nixon signed the National Cancer Act, which allocated over a billion dollars for cancer research. And so that was over 40 years ago. And so I think one question that people ask and wonder all the time is if we spent all this time and all this money on this problem, why haven't we cured it? And the answer is, it's really complicated. So I think a lot of people think of cancer as one disease, but it's really a group of diseases. And it's because your body is made up of many different tissues or different types of material. So, say, uh, a, a cancer that grows from your organs or your skin is called a carcinoma. One that grows from your bones or connective tissue is a sarcoma. You can have brain and central nervous system cancers. You can have cancers of the blood and lymph. Uh, you can have germ cell cancers, and so these are things like ovarian and prostate cancer. And even within a single subtype, you can have many different types. And so the National Cancer Institute over, recognizes over 200 types of cancer. And so this isn't a simple equation of what's the one thing that we can do to treat this one disease. We have to treat each of these diseases as an individual. And so much like when Catherine was talking about flu evolution, tumors evolve as well because they also acquire mutations. So if you imagine that one cell here in your tumor has acquired a mutation, and you give this patient chemotherapy, this one cell survives. And so that is able to form a new tumor that's no longer able to be treated by this uh, chemotherapy. And if that wasn't complicated enough, they don't develop just one mutation, they develop many mutations. And so this becomes an even more complex problem. And the things that we do to treat cancer can also cause problems as well. So when you surgically remove a tumor, you might get most of it and leave a cell behind, and that cell's able to move elsewhere in the body and form a new tumor. Um, a lot of people undergo radiation, and this might treat your initial tumor, but this can also cause mutations elsewhere, and so people who have undergone radiation have a higher risk of leukemia later in life. Uh, chemotherapy is also a problem because the way that chemo works is that it kills all dividing cells. 
including things you need like your immune system. And so, so that's why cancer patients develop really intense in flu, flu infections or cold infections. And additionally, patients undergoing chemotherapy complain about neurological defects. So if you know someone who's undergone chemotherapy, you might know the term um, chemo brain, where they feel like they can't think or process as quickly as they normally can. And so the problem can feel like this. And I'm not trying to scare you, but I am trying to give you an idea of how complicated this problem is. But we are making progress, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, the first thing that I think people don't think about now in, the, in this day and age is that um, we have a lot of patient advocacy and a lot of sympathy for patients that we didn't used to. When we didn't understand cancer, it was something that was not talked about. Um, it was something that people didn't understand if it was contagious, and so people who were going through this did it alone a lot of times. And so now that's changed a lot, and that's allowed us to develop a lot of different organizations that are fighting this problem. And that means that there are a lot of people working on this. Um, the American Association for Cancer Research has roughly 40,000 members alone, and that's only one drop in the ocean in terms of the number of organizations that are working on this problem. Um, and so that's how we end up with initiatives like the Cancer Moonshot Initiative, which um, was led by Joe Biden last year, um, and that allocated over a billion dollars to um, continue the, the fight for cancer research, and so hopefully this will uh, stay in the budget. Um, and we're also improving uh, therapies that we already have. So instead of using um, crazy amounts of radiation, we're able to use more targeted forms that uh, stick in a, a particular area, and while this mask looks scary, um, it actually ensures that the person doesn't move, and so the beam is more focused. Um, we can use combinations of drugs, so instead of using a single chemotherapy drug, we might use a combination of them, and we can dose adjust per patient depending on their individual needs. And so um, over years and years of research, we're developing many more techniques to deal with cancer than we used to have. And I think what's really important is this here. Um, here on the bottom, you have a year of death, and here is the number of deaths. And in red is the number of deaths that we would project would have occurred had we not been studying this problem. And in blue is the number of deaths that actually occurred. And so we're saving millions of people every year. And so while the, the problem is big, we are making a difference. And so there are a few really cool breakthroughs that I want to talk about. Um, the first is immunotherapy. So this is using your body's own immune system to fight off cancer, which it normally can't do. So we can take the body's immune cells, retrain them, and inject them back into the body. And so this is a 62-year-old man with lymphoma. And anywhere you see a black spot is a tumor. And so his disease was very widespread, and normally this would not be something that doctors could treat. Um, but after using immunotherapy, you can see that the number of tumors has dramatically decreased, and this would allow better surgical resection and a much better patient outcome. We're also using targeted and combination therapy, so treating each individual and each tumor as a separate problem and using different therapies for each. So you might use chemo and radiation, and then you might administer a drug that prevents the formation of blood vessels, for example. Um, so that allows us to tailor the treatment for each individual patient. And the last area, which is more near and dear to my heart, is early cancer detection. So even with the techniques that we have to detect cancer now, be it imaging or biopsying, they're not very precise and they can be invasive. Who wants to have a piece of their liver taken out and then find out that it wasn't cancer all along? So we want to find ways to use other body tissues or fewer numbers of biopsies. So um, one of the big areas is looking at blood, for example. Can we detect cancer DNA mutations in blood so that we can detect it without having to take a biopsy? So I'm going to talk a little bit about my research because I think it covers just how complicated cancer can be. Um, so 
I, our lab studies ulcerative colitis, and this is a disease that affects the colon or the large intestine. And so patients with UC have extensive inflammation along the length of their colon. And if you've ever had a canker sore in your mouth, imagine that, but all along the length of the colon. And so this is a big problem, partially because these patients are at a much higher risk of colon cancer. So we don't really know what causes the disease. It's probably uh, partially genetic. It probably has something to do with how we eat. Um, how our immune system reacts because some people have dysregulation in their immune system and it probably has to do with the gut microbiome which is the bacteria that live inside of us but in reality it's probably some complex interaction between all of these now I'm gonna put up a couple pictures of the colon um, I will change it briefly in case you are squeamish but I wanted to give fair warning um, so this is what a nice healthy colon looks like um, this is what colon cancer might look like uh, in a non-UC patient. So you see the development of a polyp, and that clues us into where cancer is developing. But this is what an ulcerative colitis patient's colon might look like. So it's very hard for us to tell where cancer develops. So what we do now is you take biopsies, uh, where we take a tissue sample and we put it on a slide, and then you look at it under a microscope. And a person has to say, yes, this is cancer, or no, it's not. And like anything done with humans, there's a degree of error and a degree of disagreement. So we're not very good at making these calls all of the time. And whereas with uh, typical colon cancer, you might only take biopsies in a few locations where things look suspicious and have one cancerous location, to reliably detect cancer in UC patients, you need at least 32 biopsies and these patients have to come in every year. And so that's a problem, not only because this isn't 100% sensitive, but because patients don't want to do it. And I think you can understand that. <laughs> and so what my lab is trying to do is instead of looking at tissue sections, what does their DNA tell us? Can we identify mutations that distinguish between people who get cancer and people who won't? And can we use that to diminish the number of uh, biopsies that we have to take back down to six? And when in doing this, can we answer any of the questions that we have about the beginnings of this disease? And so I think this really illustrates how complicated the problem is, uh, but that we are trying to use more and more improved technology to deal with these problems. And so with that, I would like to thank my lab, uh, full of towering giants. Um, I would like to thank the Engage program, um, Town Hall, and my um, graduate program, and I will take any questions. Um, you know, that really varies. Uh, there are different specializations within oncology. So a hematology oncologist is someone who just studies blood cancer. Um, and so there are many classes. And within those classes, people can specialize on a disease that they focus on. But um, I couldn't tell you exactly how many subdivisions there are. But people can specialize in whichever one they feel is most important. So I had a question about polyps. You sure. Know, just recently. Um, so, you know, I've had a couple of tests, and the last one showed one small polyp. They mm -hmm. said, oh, that's not to worry. You know, we can test you again in 10 years. And I thought, oh, well, that's pretty optimistic. What's the story on that? Is that a, they said, oh, that's pretty typical for people as they get older. Mm -hmm. What's the kind of the surrounding information about that, the development of them, and what would be considered normal and not? Yeah. So, that's a great question. Um, the advantage of colon cancer is that it develops very slowly. And so um, we can test someone at 10 years, 
uh, and say if everything looks normal then you can wait another 10 years because progression is usually slow enough that that wouldn't be a problem. Um, polyps can develop again just because mutations happen over time and so they would take that polyp, look at it, they might do DNA studies and see is there a particular mutation that we should be worried about. So you can definitely have polyps um, but not develop cancer and so if they see something concerning then they would recommend coming in sooner. Um, in UC it's a little bit different because when you put that tissue on the slide the inflammation that happens there destroys the normal tissue architecture and so that's harder to see. Um, since HPV is contagious mm -hmm. and it causes cancer, mm -hmm. can you say that um, cancer is contagious? That is a great question. Um, I would say no, because ca the cancer itself, which is cancer is defined as the, pro the uncontrolled proliferation of cells. So the, those cells themselves are not causing the cancer, it's the virus. But that's a really great question. Um, there are there there are uh, s there were studies in chickens where they were looking at infectious cancer, um, but again, that was more looking at the virus. So um, the virus causes the cancer, but the cancer, if you held a tumor to someone, say it would be the virus still and not the cancer itself. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> Is there a, a direct correlation between Crohn's disease in um, the colon and colon cancer? And if so, would your approach um, assist with earlier detection of that as well? That is a great question. There's a lot of similarities between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, except that Crohn's can be anywhere along the length of the colon. Um, there have been some studies trying to figure out what's the difference between the two. Um, but while they share some similarities genetically, they are different. So uh, we, it, there may be some, some similarities that we can use to help treat that, but because you can have Crohn's in your mouth, you could have it in your esophagus, I don't know um, how well this will translate between different tissue types. So the answer is it could, um, but Crohn's is definitely something that people are working on as well. So you brought up the moonshot and the budget. Yes. Uh, for you or the other speakers, how freaked out are you at your labs? Future <laughs> <laughs> <Get your> funding. <laughs> um, I mean, imagine eliminating a fifth of any any field, a fifth of any industry, and I think we're rightfully pretty freaked out by it. Um, you know, the, the budget that we have now is just to sustain, it's not even really for growth. The moonshot is something that they added in addition, and it had really great bipartisan support, so hopefully that will continue. But I think a lot of us are scared. Um, we don't really know what's going to happen. And, you know, I come from a small lab. I'm my PI's first graduate student, and grant funding is extremely competitive. Um, so who knows what's going to happen in the next couple of years or what happens when we graduate. And so if this is something that you care about, call your representative. <laughs> um, or if you are interested in donating on a more local level, I highly suggest the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance or the Fred Hutch. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something that ke keeps at least me up at night, so. Awesome, thank you.